Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Chris McDonald, obviously from the University of Western Australia. And today, or this morning, I'll be talking about our uh, native app for the iPhone called UWalk. So just to make sure you've understood the pronunciation, we're from the University of WA, and our app is called UWA Local Knowledge. So it's obviously a backronym <coughs> where we decided what the acronym was going to be and then worked out what it actually meant later on. So I challenge you to come up with a better one. There you go. Um, I know we don't get introduced, but it seems I'm not even worthy of a podium, so I'm just going to be wandering around, and if I fall in this hole, let me know. Um, the presentation today is also by two of my former students, Gareth Davies and Ahmed Khalaf. Um, Gareth was a master's student in computer science at UWA, and Ahmed was an honours student, and both of them just finished mid-year. And so they've put a lot of uh, input both into the development and also into the presentation. Okay, so what are we talking about? Well, we're just going to talk through some of the design ideas that we had in this application. I'm not going to show you any code unless you scream out and ask to see something. And I'm certainly not going to attempt to type in front of you. Um, don't want to get that embarrassed. So we just want to talk about design decisions, things that we did that we thought were successful, things that we did that we thought were a little bit harder than they should have been, not necessarily because the iOS was wrong, but probably more likely our experience was quite limited, and so we were learning a lot along the way. So that's what I'd like to talk about. So I'd just like to open with uh, what I think are the opportunities for on-campus applications. And on the surface, you probably say, yeah, yeah, we know what they are. But I think if you actually look in the, in the App Store, particularly if you hunt for apps by Australian universities that are promoting the university in some way, there's certainly very few of them, or they're very, very limited. So I just want to sort of refresh what we think uh, some of our opportunities are. So universities, of course, have large homogenous cohorts. They've got large student bodies, and of course, the student bodies broken up into faculties have lots of little cohorts within them, engineers and lawyers and art students and so on. And of course, there's the large cohorts that form the staff, either the academic or the professional staff. I'm an academic staff, a member of academic staff, which means somehow I'm unprofessional, but uh, that's how we call them, so we get called. Very mobile community in the sense that, of course, both staff and students are coming all day long. Um, students invariably arrive in the afternoons, they've missed their first two hours of lectures, um, and then they hang around for as long as they could either get a parking space or until the bus comes or something like that. And of course, the student population walks around campus a lot. They have to go to different lectures, different venues. We all know this, we live it all day long. We'll say they're information hungry, some of it might not be uh, knowledge, let's just call it information and be polite at the moment. A lot of stuff at universities happens in a very regimented way. We, of course, have timetables that repeat every week, and perhaps they repeat across semesters and things like that. And basically, we're either just very busy or very poorly organised. And so we have a need to consume this information just in time, either just in time study techniques, just in time exam techniques, or just in time, damn, I almost forgot to turn my library book before I had to go and catch the bus. So a lot of this is uh, very common to us. Um, a group at UWA uh, headed by Lisa Cluett has an Australian ALTC grant, Australian Learning Teaching Council, sadly a, uh, a body that's uh, fallen off the government's radar recently. But they've been studying and surveying our studi students for about four years. And what they do is at the beginning of each year and also at the end of that same year, they survey our, our first year students. So out of, uh, making this up on the spot, making out of about uh, 8,000 incoming first year students, they get a few, between one and 2,000 responses. So it's quite a reasonable response rate on which we could uh, uh, draw some meaningful stats. We find huge numbers of our, of our students, unsurprisingly, have mobile devices. And in particular, huge numbers of these mobile devices are smartphones. And by that, we've just characterised them as probably having Wi-Fi, probably having access to the internet. At the moment, for the, I should, when I say we, I don't mean I'm not involved in this group, I'm just reporting their studies. 
but 75% having smartphone access, hopefully in the next coming survey for February, March next year, we'll break this down a little bit further, try and work out the types of devices they've got. So we've clearly moved away from the situation as we saw four years ago, where students went home to use their desktop computers. Students for a while got laptop computers, brought those to uni, but increasingly student, our uni environment, certainly at UWA, is providing desktop computers in shared areas like shared laboratories and shared libraries and so on. And students are just bringing their own portable devices, smartphones or slightly increasingly um, iPads. And I guess you know, this is uh, helped a bit by UWA being, uh, having a fairly affluent student community. So we all know that our students are using these devices. We're not really pushing applications towards them in a great way. So what types of iPhone apps do we see if we look in the App Store? And I'm just sort of hunting here for Australian universities looking for keywords like university or something like that. One thing that surprised me is that a number of, perhaps it's you guys out there, a number of you are producing apps just for marketing your university. And I suspect these are being developed for international students. So they can download an app, they can see nice glossy photos of your campus and how close to the river it is and all those good educational activities. They can see videos from obviously very successful and very happy students who are having the best time in their lives at their university. Um, and we also find information about, of course, how to get into the university, what ATAR might be required, what degrees they are, how long they run, all those sort of prerequisite information. Increasingly, we're also seeing a number of universities having um, apps that just last for one day or maybe two days. That is an open day, often in August, September, that we've just seen uh, just pass. And of course, they have lots of static information. We hope that people bring them, download them to the device, bring their device to the university. Um, probably won't need to connect to the university's Wi-Fi while they're there, because that can be a bit problematic, as we know. And again, they will have lots of static information that pertains to the university, but of course, it's all very glossy. We want students to, to come next year, and so that's the whole purpose of Open Days. Perhaps more generally, these things that I couldn't think of a better title, title just general applications. Most of the information is static. There'll obviously be campus maps on there. Some of the maps that we see in applications are fixed, such as PDFs that you can scroll around. Some of them embed links off to Google Maps in the standard map kit way and so on. Some applications will have staff directories, maybe contact directories for uh, secretarial administrative staff and so on. And some will in fact uh, also connect to the internet, specifically pulling down uh, perhaps news feeds by RSS or maybe providing notifications of on-time events. And I should also have a shout out for private contributions. These are sort of a double-edged sword. Um, while hunting around this last week preparing for this presentation, I think it's the University of Wollongong, where a student, quite literally, students just produced an application, which is, I think, University of Wollongong car parking. And it's designed where people will just say, hey, gee, I just saw one in car park three, you better be quick. So it's sort of a very, very dedicated Twitter feed or something like that. Um, UWA until last year had, or maybe the beginning of this year, had a private contribution from one of our students where he'd just taken the UWA campus map which is a PDF, wrapped it up in a, in a view, submitted that to the App Store, and they said, this is the official UWA app. Now, in some sense, he was doing a great service, but the app was, so the PDF that he downloaded was three years wrong and didn't have all these maps on and all this sort of stuff. So um, that got pulled. I don't know who by, not by myself. But obviously, those people make a contribution in terms of marketing the university, and so it's probably important to get it right. UWA is a great university, but I'll tell you about why it's good for the types of applications we're developing. Um, it's roughly a kilometre wide, two and a half kilometres long, so you can scale that against your own university. We don't have any roads running through the middle, so that aids mobility. We don't have to direct people in certain ways. There's clearly lots of paths all the way through and so on. Very good public transport. Uh, we're on a main highway that takes students both to Perth and to Fremantle and to major railway stations and also bus stations. Um, one thing that's good for us, I think, is that we have a single campus. There are applications, I think, by the University of Queensland or maybe Griffith 
got two or three campuses and so their apps, you know, you sort of have to select the campus first of all and then find the information that's relevant to you. Obviously necessary, but uh, us having only a single campus makes it uh, fairly good for us. Fairly large teaching hospital, which is just getting bigger and bigger, and also residential colleges that have uh, been interested in our work as well. Lots and lots of wireless access points, and this has been um, a great improvement at UWI over the last couple of years. A great rollout of Cisco uh, Wi-Fi access points. Nearly, coverage nearly everywhere except standing in the middle of a few gardens and things like that. So it's pretty good. One thing that I hadn't really tweaked on was that most of our buildings and venues are named after our founders or famous alumni or famous academics. And so that can make it, of course, very difficult for brand new students, first year students in the first couple of weeks to find their lectures. I didn't tweak it until this, until I went to a talk at Edith Cowan University in WA a few weeks ago, and the talk was in building number three, and unsurprisingly, that was next to building number four, and so on. And it was pretty easy to find them both on a map and also to find your way around campus. Where our buildings and venues are named after people, it makes no sense. You can't very readily find them. Uh, even on a map, we've got, of course, these billboard type maps all over the place. And of course, they're all listed in alphabetical order, which is OK, but not if you're working backwards. Um, we also, just, just as an aside, we've, we've got a building next to our computer science building that's just been renamed. It used to be General Purpose Building 2, so that was pretty exciting. It's just been named after, renamed after a former vice chancellor, and his name was Robert Street. And that's, you know, great. That's what it's been renamed to. But Courier is, of course, having a hell of a problem finding the Robert Street building because, of course, there is no Robert Street. <laughs> There's no street named Robert, whatever. So where did U Walk come from? Well, it actually started a year before, not as the U Walk application. I teach a number of third and fourth year um, courses in our computer science department, one of them computer networking, we set the students a task to learn how to implement uh, different implementations of synchronous and asynchronous networking. And so the application involved was for them to walk around campus, which basically means they didn't move more than 200 metres away from the computer science building, very sad. Um, and they were to plot, to listen, track and plot Wi-Fi access points, then do some trilateration on the Wi-Fi access points to roughly work out where they were and then to query a server, which I wrote, and I would download to them the photograph that they should be seeing at that particular point. So sort of poor man's street view in reverse, if you like. Um, just for those, I saw a few of you tweak up when I said Wi-Fi access points. This obviously had to use a technology which Apple doesn't support. It starts with the letter J. Um, it's not Java. Um, sorry about that. And so it's not an application that would ever make it into the App Store because it uses undocumented libraries which haven't changed on the iOS for about four years, but clearly very helpful. A lot of students like this, not so much that it was about networking, but simply because it was about a small mobile device. And I guess for them, it's what I was interested in programming calculators 25 years ago or more. We had a couple of students that were in this course. I think one of them, I think Gareth was just listening in on this course and they had to do year-length projects, 50% of their assessment. And so they came to me and we talked about how we could write a bigger app that did a lot more to do with localization. So what was our goal? Well, our goal was to develop a native app. And perhaps today, that's a little bit more controversial than it was at the time. Um, talk a little bit more about that later on. We wanted a native app that had most of the information on the device already. In particular, over a year ago, we had only modest Wi-Fi coverage. Today, we have very good Wi-Fi coverage, but it does take about 10 seconds or more to associate. Now, for our very hectic students, 10 seconds is a lifetime, apparently. So if their questions can be answered in under 30 seconds, we want the device to be able to do that without requiring connectivity to the Wi-Fi. If it needs it, well, obviously, that's something they just have to suffer. But that was the objective, to get very quick answers to particular problems. We'd like it aware of the student's location and their time and their enrolment, fairly obviously being in a university environment, 
And again, you might tweak up about the idea of how do you do location awareness if you don't actually have connectivity. Might come back to that point a little bit later on. We did not, despite a lot of people getting enthused and saying, oh great, finally someone at UWA is developing a campus app, we just said we are not going to develop an app that delivers information that best gets read through web pages. Okay, now this is sort of a double-edged sword. At, universe, at UWA, I believe we're rather amiss and behind in developing um, applications for mobile devices. Our IT section has joined with the library, now called IT services. The second word isn't usually appropriate. Um, but IT services purchases a lot of software. They do not write a lot of software anymore. It's part of this business model, the corporatization of our university and so on. And so that's a little bit threatening to some of us that want to develop software as a cottage industry. Um, it's all about developing products, measuring the risk, not worrying, you know, being more concerned about whether a product would fail and these sort of things. We also didn't want to replicate existing iPhone applications. And I don't mean ones in the App Store, I mean it's the ones that people expect on their device. So we didn't really want to build in a calendaring facility or necessarily a communication or a buddy tracking system, although we've been um, politely pressured a little bit to include some of these ideas. So how did we do it? Well, we wanted also, this should have been a goal, to have the option to build a framework that supported a whole bunch of standard modules. And as people became interested in our application, obviously very hopeful, um, they would come and ask us to write more, at more uh, modules for them. And this has been successful, perhaps a little bit ironic that our application hasn't even made the App Store yet, so we don't even know if it'll be approved, but people are coming to us with blank checks, and I say blank because they're not signed, um, saying we would like applications for our residential college, we would like applications to deliver the daily menu at some of the cafeteria on campus and those sort of things. So we do have increased interest from people that clearly don't want to get into the job of writing a whole mobile application just for them and recognises the opportunity to embed it in something else that seems to work. So we naturally have core modules and we did this by both thinking about what modules would be necessary and talking to a whole bunch of people. Specifically, we moved away from computer science students. They have a very blinkered view, dare I say, of what particular core facilities are you know, it, oh, it must have, you know, the, the Unix manual online or something like that. We talked to humanities students, we talked to lawyers, we talked to medical students as well. And look, very obviously, they all said mapping was fairly important, searching all of the modules in a fairly consistent way, and route planning. So, fairly obvious that if people don't know how to get to a venue or need quick guidance to a particular venue, we need to, um, to route them or route them, depending on how you pronounce it. I'm trying not to say root because there was uh, an application in the App Store last year called Root Finder, which you can imagine how it was spelt. Um, and it was a university application and it was sort of for rating your cohort and those sort of things. And so I'm going to try and say root quite consciously. No, I'm going to say route. <laughs> you can edit that out, I'm sure. Um, we wanted our modules pretty much to follow an object oriented paradigm, although. That wasn't our initial goal. Perhaps maybe object-oriented is a great thing. We started thinking about how to do this. We said every module must, you know, you must call it and sort of open it in a particular way. When you're finished with it, you must close it in a particular way. You must be able to search it and only the module itself knows how to access its own data and how it's represented and what search queries mean and so on. And this very much became an object-oriented view of what we were trying to do. While we all had experience with object-oriented programming, this was all, for all of us, this was our first exposure to Objective-C in any way. I'd done some Objective-C programming on desktop Macs, but not on iOS before this. So we wanted everything to be consistent. This is what it looks like at the moment, and I will point out that we've done lots of coding, but zero design work. We fortunately do have access to people that will be able to provide some great graphics for us, and uh, they're willing to help with our project. Just for those that want to knock up something casually, I'll point out that all of our icons, for example, there's a fantastic website called thenounproject.org. And the Noun Project's got about 700 icons at the moment. It grows 
a few a week. And they've just got all these very standard icons that you see all, the, all around the world. I hadn't appreciated how standard these were. So if you go to an airport or a bus station, for example, you'll see a whole bunch of very standard things. So all of our modules, each represented by a little icon there, look very standard. We have to be quite careful. The, uh, the guidelines for getting stuff into the App Store says that your apps must not look like the springboard or winterboard, depending on where you're coming from. So you're not allowed to confuse the user that this is the whole iPhone. You know, you've got to make it quite clear that this is an application. Maybe we're doing that by having a tab bar down here, but I'll talk about our tab bar in a minute. Also, all of our application, sorry, all of our icons, when they're actually running, their icon or its representation moves into the tab bar. So the tab bar both becomes an indication of which module is running and also a history of ones that you've done recently. So it sort of just shuffles off to the left and reorganizes itself. We'll show that in a minute. So this is uh, that part of the talk that says, let's get away from the convention. Not sure how much of the convention you're allowed to leave behind when you're trying to get things uh, accepted. So what do we do with searching? So searching obviously is pretty core to most modules. You want to ask the module that has the bus timetables when the next bus is coming. But you also want to ask it when the next 102 is coming. So you want to actually provide details that mean something to that module. You want to use the word coffee to describe venues. Maybe you want to describe um, particular food that's sold at a venue and it doesn't have it in the title and so on. So all of the modules know how to search themselves and we just iterate through them all asking them all what's going on with some humorous results. We have um, a fellow called Associate Professor Beer and we also have a tavern. So they both pop up appropriately as you search for those. I'll give you an example in a minute. We can also search not just by string, by typing into the normal text boxes, search boxes and so on, but also by location. So by holding your finger down on the map, we'll show in a minute, naturally it describes the venues that are close to you and then you can further click on them to go into relevant modules. So nothing really surprising except still a bit blurry, but remember you had some wine last night. Um, we would have uh, a search module, and quite literally this is the module that's being run. We can run it by tapping on its icon here in the, in the tab bar. We're searching for the word coffee, and it very quickly goes through all the modules, finds out what's available, and of course multiple modules will provide multiple hits. They get truncated in case there's millions of them and then you can go into the module and further search for what you want. So we've just found a particular coffee shop there. Nothing unsurprising. Okay, mapping. Well, here we go. This will offend a few people whose talk I went to yesterday. We did our own mapping. We didn't use MapKit, and we have a number of reasons for this. On the uh, left-hand side, you'll see a fairly standard Google Maps view of the University of Western Australia. Now this means either one of two things. They haven't plotted internal details because we don't have roads running through the campus or like a lot of places in WA, someone's just dug it up and sold it to the Chinese. And maybe that's what's happened. It's just a big empty paddock at the moment. Instead of using Google Maps and instead of even using Google Satellite View, we've chosen, well, we've asked politely for a company uh, registered in Perth but is doing a lot of work Australia-wide called Nearmap. Neomap actually flies small Cessna aeroplanes over main capital cities and large towns. And they provide something very similar to the satellite views that um, Google will provide, but you can just zoom in almost indefinitely. You can zoom in and a brick, a standard house brick, will occupy about a quarter of an iPhone screen. So it's a little bit silly. I mean, it's a little bit great, but we certainly don't zoom in that much for most of our work. What we do, and again, I'm falling back on this idea that universities are fairly fixed uh, environments, is that we have all of the tiles not preloaded, they're obviously sitting in memory, but we don't have to go out to the network to get our own tiles. We sh could, should, trying to use the right word there, probably review what MapKit provides now. Historically, MapKit didn't allow you to case your own tiles. Now they seem to have changed that uh, quite recently. So. It's something that we'll definitely look at in the near future, whether we should review the use of MapKit. Doing your own mapping, of course, doesn't just mean the tiles, 
means providing lots of layers for things. So we've got layers for our callouts, disclosure boxes, whether we put pins in fair obvious areas, whether we put routes in a particular view and then just sandwich them on top of another. So fairly obvious what's going on. And of course, we tried to make the whole thing very consistent, which sort of meant it's a, it's a rather circular information flow amongst all the modules. So once you've found a particular location, you might have done that by searching, you might have done that by holding your finger down on the map to highlight a building. It will pop up a disclosure box, give you some primary and secondary information about that, and then again you can hit a disclosure icon and it'll jump off to whatever the relevant information is. So in this case, it's highlighted a bus stop. You click on that, it tells you which buses are about to arrive at that particular bus stop. You would click on a building, it would probably tell you it's, say, the computer science building, and perhaps you could get further information about who's inside that building. Not at the moment, but who should be inside that building. We also do our own route planning, and so this is sort of the next evolution, I guess, beyond doing our own mapping. It's a fairly uh, self-contained environment, so we've identified 1,100 locations, which include building venues, lecture theatres, all the obvious sort of things, and also some waypoints for navigation. So the 650 waypoints are identified as places where you would probably have to turn if you were just walking along a straight path. So a brick path, for example, with a, an X or a T junction in it, you'd have a waypoint at obvious intersection of those two paths. We also have waypoints on pathways that are immediately outside a door of a venue, such as a lecture theatre or something like that. And so our route planning involves knowing where you currently are or where you claim to be, finding the shortest path from there to one of the core paths connected by the waypoints, and then walking along these core paths until you get to your stepping off point. So this works fairly well. Um, we use fairly standard uh, Warshall's transitive closure algorithm. Those of you that did computer science and degrees and all those sort of things, there is a purpose to all that stuff you had to study. And so here is an algorithm which very, very quickly in the matter of minutes takes our roughly 1,000 points, identifies the shortest path between all of them, and also gives you the path information. So that means that if you identify where you are, you can use core location if you choose, or you can say, I just happen to be here and I need to go to my next lecture, it will draw the path to get there. Um, we keep the next hop information and all the distances on the device. They're not very big. They're probably about 100 kilobytes for all of the set of data that we, that we manage. So this, again, means we don't have to go off the device and we can find routes between anywhere and anywhere else in well under a second. Well, very much under a second because you can walk around with core location and it'll actually change the, the route as you move along. We also have attributes ascribed to each of these core paths that I talked about. Obviously the standard places where people walk, nothing very exciting there, but for people in wheelchairs we clearly don't want to guide them downstairs or upstairs as we have on some of our paths. If it's raining people might choose to stay under cover for most of their distance and at night time we have a whole bunch of paths that are well lit for security reasons. So you can choose the route you're going to take by selecting the attributes and then the route planning will choose an obvious route along there. Okay, so what about all our data? Where did we get it from? Roughly how big it is? Well, getting data from external sources is surprisingly easy. In fact, they're surprisingly willing to give you information um, provided, of course, you give them attribution. So it seems a rite of passage to have weather information that you extract from the Bureau of Meteorology. Fairly trivial to do. It's not very exciting that you know the temperature or the forecast, but we can go, and I'll show an example later on, we can go in through the weather radar and see if there's any rain coming and decide, are we going to catch the bus or are we going to stay in the library for another hour? Information from TransPerth was impressively easy to get. I think Perth was one of the first cities in Australia, there are a few more now, that use the Google Transit format, format for bus and train and, and ferry data. So we can download all of the whole year's bus and train data from TransPerth, our bus authority. That's about 90 megabytes in size. 
We strip that down beautifully using some uh, orc scripts. And if you're about half my age and want to argue whether it should be Perl or Python, you can go and step outside. Um, we use orc, it works very well, we can write it very fast. Um, and so that's only about 500 uh, kilobytes. So about half a megabyte contains all the bus information seven days a week for everything going past UWA. So that's fairly effective. Information that we had to get from other groups on campus, pretty easy to get. The student services, the student undergraduate guild um, were very excited that we were doing this, unsurprisingly. We talked with the, um, the guild president for a while and a few other uh, people on his committee. I don't think they, you know, they represent the whole student body, but it was fairly obvious what they would like as well. So they've given us access to uh, data on web pages, data that's sort of hidden about the opening times of all the venues and so on. And the application is aware of when venues are open, when they're closed, whether they're open on Sundays, whether they're closed on public holidays, those sort of things. And for all of the information, if the location is actually known, all of our modules consistently provide a link off to the map so you can find it. And then once it's identified on the map, consistently you can go back to the application. People in the library were very helpful. Um, the library, dare I say, is probably feeling a little bit guilty because they would like to develop mobile applications as well. But because they're part of the more formal structure of the university IT services, you know, it has to be a project and they have to get a grant and a project manager and meetings and all that sort of stuff. And we've just been talking with individuals employed within library services that are just enthused about mobile apps. So they would just like to be involved, even though uh, the more formal infrastructure hasn't gone down that path yet. So here's a tiny module that reports the number of available public computers in our libraries. Clicking on it naturally highlights where the library is on campus. Other stuff on campus, let's politely say, not so easy to find out. Okay, you can imagine what I would say if I was going to say something at this point. Um, we have campus-wide logins, so using our very, very personal university number there, that we have consistent campus-wide uh, logins. To get access to that through a mobile device is technically not difficult, but it's very politically difficult. Okay, so our computer science department, we were reminded that our computer science department was not part of the university and hence shouldn't be doing this sort of stuff. It was a little bit challenging because I can write an academic paper any time I like and put the university's byline on. I can give a presentation at a conference with the university's crest on, on almost any topic except for smoking or Nazis or something like that. If I write a piece of software, oh no, it's not allowed to be associated with the university until it's gone through this horrid process. The most difficult part of getting our application uh, begrudgingly approved, I'll leave it at that, was putting the crest in the top right hand corner. You know, oh, that symbolises it's from the university. Well, yes, that's why we want to put the crest there. And that's been a huge challenge and it hasn't really been resolved. Getting access to students' timetable information, and this is not complete because there is now, unsurprisingly, a little icon so you can click on a, a timetable item and it'll take you off to the venue on the map and so on. Getting access to the timetable information um, at the moment, we don't technically have that, but apparently the code works. So eventually we will technically have that ask and the code will still work, so that'll be good. Um, students have to log in, they have to identify themselves. We do not have the mobile application authenticating with the LDAP service directly. We have the student's mobile application communicating with our own server in computer science and that passes the request off to the LDAP server. So it's part of managing the load and um, the people managing the LDAP service feel that that's a little bit more secure. So, but that's been the difficult process, is actually dealing with the people who have service in their title. Okay, so that'll be a message, I think, for you guys as well. How do we store all the data on the device? I said we like to um, put it all on there and not use uh, network-borne data very much. Well, just about all of our modules have small data requirements. By that I mean typically under 100 kilobytes, maybe even only 10 kilobytes. And in nearly all cases, that application 
is textual, and so property list files or plist files on the iOS work very well. We don't make a lot of use of dictionaries and double indexed arrays. We do that if the data represents it. But for example, um, all the venues, and so all the uh, cafeteria and the like on campus, is just represented as an enormous single vector of strings. And we know that the latitude and longitude might be the first of those strings, and the name the next one, and the opening hours the next one, and so on. So we're just striding through that array in a very linear fashion. This turns out to be much, much faster in loading. Not hugely faster, we're talking about two and a half seconds over one second for certain large data. So sometimes you just think, well, I know I'm supposed to be programming in Objective-C, but I can program a lot of this stuff in C very quickly, and it'll end up running a lot more quickly. There was a presentation at DevWorld last year. Sorry, I've forgotten the author, particularly if you're here. But they gave a presentation about how to speed up iOS data management. I'd encourage you to go to the website, download that, and have a look at it. Our staff directory has got about 9,000 staff. Now, that sounds a lot, but I should point out that many of those are sort of postgraduate students as well, but we keep those in the staff directory. In consequence, that um, results in a very large property list file. Now, there is no problem for the poor old iPhone to load that in. It's only about a megabyte. Okay, so we don't have to worry about the size of it, but the speed of loading that in is a little bit slow. So as we search, for example, for Professor Beer, once we type the B and the E, and it's done a, a lap through all of the modules to ask whether that means anything to them, um, it only then finishes loading the, um, the plist data. So we need to rethink this. This is a little bit slow. Um, it's reasonable on an iPhone 4. On an iPhone 3GS, it's, it's not intolerably slow, but it just noticeably slow affects the performance of the, uh, of the interface. So we might think we should use perhaps some index data. For all of our route planning, well, we're just using raw integers and floating point values, and we simply load those as native, um, native objects. They're not, um, sorry, all of that code's managed in C, not Objective C, and so we just work out the size of the file, preload the whole matrix in one go. And all of the map tiles, I mentioned they're coming from this company called Nearmap, um, they're worried reasonably about us putting the tiles into the App Store. Now, we were sort of aiming at this upper bound of about 15 megabytes. The tiles themselves comprise 7.5 megabytes. But Neomap doesn't want those in the App Store. So they are encrypted. And when they're loaded, essentially off disk on iOS, they're decrypted. Um, that's not to say someone, it's not hard to get in and work out what's going on. But maybe uh, it's a little bit strong to thwart most access. So it's OK to talk about all that static data that we've been talking about. But of course, the other issue is how do we update it? Well, we haven't taken a very fine-grained approach to this. And the reason we haven't got a fine-grained approach to this is our, our data actually updates very infrequently compared to a lot of other applications you'll see on your iPhone. For example, if we get a new staff member on day one, on a Monday, they probably won't appear in the staff directory until about Wednesday or Thursday anyway. So, you know, the immediacy of access to this new information is not critically important. The other one that students are a little bit uh, confused about is that they will go to a computer-based service or maybe even a human over a counter and change their timetable or change their enrolment or something like that. They'll go back to maybe the computer science labs and find out their enrolment hasn't been changed yet. So it's this immediacy of, uh, of demand by students. Uh, basically, all the timetable information is probably updated every night, and we simply download uh, relevant stuff either on demand or at about 4 o'clock in the morning. So each particular device, if it chooses to update its data simply by going into the settings, works out its current date and time, and also the date and time of its last update or the, the newest file that it has in its data directory and simply presents that to a server in our computer science building. We zip up all of the files that they're interested in, possibly including their own personal timetable, and send that back as a zip file over secure HTTP. Um, one thing that we found, and hopefully someone can correct me here, 
is that we couldn't find zip libraries inside iOS. Does anyone know if they're out there in a class we haven't found yet? No? Good. That's why this is an a basic session, because you don't know the answer. Um, we couldn't find it either. Uh, we like to deliver multiple files back in a single transaction. You found some. It's available as a C library, but yeah, not, we hadn't done this part in C at the moment. We've done it in Objective C. Um, you know, the ability to send multiple files back in a single bundle and then explode them in the right directory and so on. So zip will allow you, I think, to just so zlib will allow you to you know just compress a file, but it doesn't do the directory management on top of that. Anyway, fortunately, we found a third-party uh, zip construct, we only need to unzip, we don't actually need to send any data back to our service. And so fairly typically is, say, when the staff directory updates, that's roughly four o'clock every morning, if you choose to update your application, it's about 160 kilobytes once it's all been compressed and sent down. And f using our campus Wi-Fi, that comes down in about four to five seconds. So the update speed is quite reasonable, but you do have to select it. So how do we manage this sort of idea of dual dates? Nothing really complicated. You're probably aware that normally applications are not supposed to write all over the disk. Under iOS, they're only supposed to write in their sort of sandboxed folder. And in particular, we're encouraged to write stuff in the documents directory below the, the main bundle. And so initially, the application is shipped with a whole bunch of uh, plist files, which are the standard ones and anything that is updated in the future actually gets placed in the documents directory. And then consistently throughout our code, if any of the modules wants to go and find one of their property list files, first looks in documents, then looks in main bundle. So very obvious strategy as to how to manage the, uh, the two forms of dates. Okay, well, what's the future for our application? Which is maybe a little bit premature because we haven't even got it into the app store. We aim to do that by November hopefully to come out in time for the beginning of our next semester next year. Um, a few million things are happening at UWA next year, so there's a little bit happening going on there. We've already started asking people for new proposals, and in fact these are all coming from university departments or sections that similarly don't do their own programming and you know, don't know where to go and look. So at UWA, and it may be different at your universities, there seems to be uh, a paucity of groups that are able to do programming. Maybe we uh, should charge more money, maybe we should charge some money, um, but uh, we're certainly starting to take requests from, from uh, residential colleges. Student groups would like, so UWA devised the application Lectopia for recording uh, lectures and so on. I think it's now called Echo 360. So based upon students' timetables, we want now a module to go and automatically download these in the background once the application is informed that your new lectures are available while you're running off to catch the bus because it's about to start raining. So it'll have lots of use, this application. We also have other groups on campus interested in some other mapping projects. So in particular, we have a lot of tour groups coming to UWA, usually on the weekends, and they would like to visit statues and gardens and old buildings and all those sort of things. So similarly, they would like um, a particular application for that. Okay, well, that's about all I had to say. If you would like to see a bit of frightening code or a bit of execution, not that whizzy, but uh, I'll just shut that down. Just see if I can get my uh, Wi-Fi back. No, maybe I can't. Should have left the Wi-Fi on. So nothing exciting will pop up. So again, here is all of our applications. It's not supposed to be a springboard type thing, but people can either move their modules around if they have preferences. Uh, when we get too many of them, we'll be able to push them off to the side and they'll disappear. If we invoke a particular module, notice how that module now has moved down to the tab bar it's probably violating a few uh, guidelines as to what's going on, but it's obviously the bus, sorry, the, uh, the module that's running at the moment. We could find any particular information using our, our mapping of where all the bus stops are around campus. Uh, 
or we could find a particular bus stop if we needed to, who knows, find the buses that are about to leave there. Um, now this is a little bit confused because my laptop's on Melbourne time but the bus timetable's in Perth time so don't go and catch any of those. Um, and it'll just find the ones that are about to arrive or the ones arriving in particular time. With respect to the route planning, which I can't show you today, uh, there is the option to find out the closest bus, bus stop which will, you know, the bus that you want to catch goes to. So a lot of those things are sort of coordinated. We might be able to observe the slowdown a little bit in the property lists here. So if we look for beer, that wasn't too bad actually, uh, we can find it's gone through all of the modules in that case. <laughs> They've each loaded their data on demand if it wasn't already loaded, and we've found a couple of modules that had the information. In this particular case, we have uh, the person that we were searching for. Alternatively, unsurprisingly, uh, so I can find myself, um, provides information about me again into the map. You can find out where my office is, doesn't necessarily mean I'm there, and something that I've only realised is quite disturbing for me, an academic, is that it comes up with my phone number there, and of course when you click it, the phone rings. So this opportunity for all of your hundreds of students to have access to your phone whenever they want to call you. Um, not sure if we need a notification service to say don't ring him right now because he doesn't want to take your call. Um, but you know, that's the sort of immediacy, the information that's provided by having online directories and applications such as this. That's about it, unless anyone's got any particular questions they'd like to ask either about why we made particular choices or again, what we found hard or anything like that. Just a question about the route planning. Yes. Um, the, how do you handle different levels in buildings? Do you, or do you just go straight to the building and say it's on at the... At the moment, um, while we record all the locations, that's something we do need to do. Uh, in particular, working out, you don't actually want to go to doors, you want to go to elevators if you're in a, a wheelchair and stuff like that. We ended up writing our own, I think, somewhere. So, so we ended up writing our own little tiny application. For reasons that I like ORC, I also like Tickle TK. So we wrote our own little interface using exactly the same tiles to highlight where all the waypoints are on campus. And so then that will get ferreted away into a file, basically is a series of latitude and longitudes. In this case, we're just looking at the standard paths, for example. Um, but at wheelchairs, of course, we'd have fewer paths that are possible. And so, you know, if someone, it's a little bit dubious because you end up with, you know, here are all the paths around our oval but of course you can't get a student to walk from one edge of the oval to the other by going around a brick path on a nice sunny day. So uh, I know some universities fill in their ovals with concrete paths because that's where the goats walk, um, but we haven't done that yet. So we do our own route planning this way to capture the data. We've found this more convenient to have our own data formats than to use Google Earth or something and generate KM, uh, KMM, KML files. Sorry, another question. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to clarify something you were saying earlier on about the, um, uh, about the route planning. You were talking about finding locations okay. uh, from triangulating. All right, so. Okay, okay, so if you. You're saying that using. Yeah. Um, sorry, using undocumented APIs. Just, no, 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 it's just an algorithm. It's a very historic, probably from the 60s algorithm for route planning. Sure, sure, but to actually. Sorry, I may have picked up on. on so you. How our, how our route planning works or, or what? I did talk about an undocumented API, but that's an earlier project that we were doing Wi-Fi localization. No, this is all, uh, there, is, there is no need for core location stuff here. Core location also, as everyone knows, doesn't work very well indoors. So core location based upon GPS or even assisted GPS doesn't work very well indoors. We would love, and we've had an experiment, we have a fairly large multi-story building which is our new science library with lots of offices, sorry, our new biomedical library, uh, this one here. And we've tried some Wi-Fi localization in there that works extremely well. So you can determine where Professor Smith's office is to within about 20 feet. 
So that's quite a good thing, but we can't get that into the App Store because it uses undocumented APIs. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm not hesitant to. I'd like to get it sort of finished-ish and then give it away. Uh, sorry, get it finished, get it you know, pushed through the App Store. I really don't mind because um, I think this is something all universities should do. And you know, we're not competing against one another. Even if you were Curtin University, we're not really competing for you on the strength of an application. Uh, we should be able to work together to push these sort of things out. There's a few challenges. Obviously, your university's data would be different to ours, you know, the representation and stuff like that. We had a visit from our, we have an office, an office of innovation and intellectual property or something like that. And a fellow came and gave us this great spiel about what intellectual property was and how it was so valuable to our university. And uh, I think the, the quote that got me, I'm big L, a little L, left-wing academic, obviously, um, said, universities leak knowledge. So we, have to, we can't really give this away if it's worth something. So that got on my goat a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I'd be happy to do something like that probably in the near future. Yeah. Yes, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> ah, Curtin's one of our opposition customers. <laughs> That's all right. No. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah, so I think you know, we're having exactly the same struggles at UWA, but our central IT group is not developing a campus app. And we're saying we've got one almost finished, we're quite willing to give it away, we're quite willing to keep supporting it, doing all those sort of things. Uh, but because we don't have a budget, that's been the biggest nasty thing. We've been reminded we're not part of the university, and that grates a lot, uh, a lot, a lot. Um, so yeah, it's, it sounds like the same sort of struggles. Uh, there is, I mean, there is a group within our IT and library services that have reminded us that there's a fairly good app produced by a company that integrates with Moodle quite well. Now, while Google is, uh, sorry, while Moodle is, is free, this mobile app for campuses is not free, but our IT services say, well, look, it's a great American company that's obviously got a very well-paid CEO, and this will be a better product than some sort of dinky, you know, cottage industry. Um, not sure whether any of our students are here. I know there's a few here this week. Um, our students seem to like the fact that we develop software and are willing to put it out there. So our computer science department for perhaps 12 years, we've run our own mark system and submission system and all those typical sort of things. We haven't used WebCT. We absolutely hate WebCT, but, you know. And our students, I think, quite like the fact that we've developed it ourselves and we're explaining how it works and those sort of things. And mobile apps is exactly the same. We've had a lot of interest just from our undergraduate students. Um, so same, same political struggles. Okay. Oh, and in the same, in the same business unit or something. That's a bit frightening. So it sounds like your business unit is bigger than ours. Ours is not developing apps because they're sort of small that they can't afford to. But if you've got three teams, that's... Uh, but you're on a research block grant, aren't you? That's right. I remember how ANU gets funded. <laughs> As the newspapers tell us. OK. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, no, this was just word of mouth, just talking to people. Uh, we left some flyers in libraries and, and coffee shops and stuff like that on campus, asking people to either phone us or sending in something. So it wasn't a structured survey. Uh, it only drew in about 50 responses from students and stuff. So it wasn't... Uh, yeah, it was sort of what, what would they want or more particularly what would they expect. I think we worded it that way. And they said particularly mapping and you know, fairly obvious things, and we've just about implemented most of those. Some students would like, um, they would like to know when their exams are. 
Okay, now we, we're not allowed to present that information to them. We can get it by scraping a web page, obviously. But if we present it, then implicitly we're taking responsibility for the correctness of the information. And we don't want students to, you know, miss exams or something like that. So there's some things that we're quite happy not to do, to be honest. Technically, you can do them, but you might not want to take responsibility for them. We, we recognised that there was lots of ways to do it and we just said, what's the easiest way to do it? So all of our requests from the device, at the moment there's only two requests leave the device. Oh, sorry, no, that's not strictly true. There's about four requests, there's the weather, there's the logging in, there's the daily updates and stuff. They all just go through CGI across HTTPS to our standard computer science web server and that gets the information that's either been pre-packaged each day or sort of on demand. We fetch data from the Weather Bureau every 30 minutes and cache it so that it doesn't get hammered by individual requests, and we just deliver that back. And uh, yes, it could be a service and all those sort of things, but we're very happy to write 10 lines of Objective-C using iOS to do that. So maybe we're lazy, but we didn't have to put in a lot of work on the server side of it at all. Yes, I, I don't know. Yep. No, we've only had about 20 people using it concurrently. So, you know, if that scales to 25,000, we'll be really happy, uh, but it probably won't. Um, but we don't anticipate people will download stuff very much, uh, particularly once people recognise that the updates only occur once a day and most of the updates are not applicable to them. Uh, if we start to have notification-based services about daily events and those sort of things, uh, then that might change the infrastructure to, you know, people would register and so on. One thing that students have asked us to do and one we would love to do is actually buddy tracking so that students can be informed when their friends have arrived on campus. Now, of course, you can do that through a lot of external services. People said it would be great if it was just sort of built into the application. And we've actually, we know how to do that because if our students associate with our Wi-Fi access points, without using undocumented features on the device, we know to within about 30 metres where the student actually is on campus because of which access point they're accessing. Information services is just mulling over whether they'll give us access to that association data. If they do, we'll be able to say your friend John Smith has now arrived on campus and he's at the car park or you know, he's headed towards lunch or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have to start saying, oh, what about privacy preferences and all those sort of things. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to see that. By the university. Yeah. Yeah, what the students want tends to often be what the university is very risk averse to. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge there, yeah. Any other questions? No, gone quiet. Thank you for your questions. Thanks for attending today. Tough.